If there's one thing that the majority of Americans can pretty much all agree upon, is that we all kind of hate graffiti. In the city of Chicago, for example, the Department of Streets and Sanitation fielded almost 18,000 calls in 2017 to do something about graffiti, prompting City Hall to make graffiti removal a bigger priority. In the past five years, they've not only increased their graffiti fighting fleet to 22 vehicles with the addition of three graffiti removal crew trucks and two chemical removal trucks, but the Chicago Transit Authority and the Chicago Police Department have invested in a labyrinth of surveillance cameras in order to capture, identify, and arrest those vandalizing rail stations and on rail cars and fine them to the tune of thousands of dollars. But on the other side of the pond, the attitudes towards graffiti have changed quite considerably. Cities like Berlin embrace graffiti as a cultural asset, and visitors are given tours of the highlights. And in the posh art galleries and auction houses, the fame and notoriety of Banksy has reached infamy on the level of many classically celebrated artists. Today, his work not only commands the respects of art critics, but has sold for millions at reputable art auctions like Sotheby's in London. And here in my home city of Freiburg, graffiti and street art are not only prominent, but objectively beautiful. So is graffiti art or vandalism? Who gets to decide? And why are the legal recourses for property owners and artists alike so different between the US and Germany? Well, let's take a look. Although graffiti is generally accepted to be termed a contemporary art form, truth be told, graffiti has been around for thousands of years. Just look at these 30,000 year old examples of cave art found in Southern France and the equally old Aboriginal rock formations in Australia. Along with these incredibly ancient examples, archeologists have found a vast amount of graffiti that's over 2000 years old throughout the lost city of Pompeii. Much of what historians and archaeologists know about the history of Pompeii today was learned from writing discovered on walls. In fact, the word graffiti itself stems from the Italian word graffiato, meaning scratched. Now, before we go too far down the rabbit hole of graffiti, I do think it's important that we do make the distinction between what's generally seen as two very different forms of graffiti. And that's the distinction of street art versus tagging. Often when we say graffiti, what we really mean is tagging or tags. By most reports, good graffiti has some artistic merit, while tagging is often seen as an ego trip that usually lacks any such quality. A good distinction I found at a graffiti site read that street art is about the audience, whereas graffiti tagging is about the tagger. But truth be told, trying to categorize graffiti into these two distinct camps is actually really difficult. As the art form has evolved, so too have the connotations surrounding it. And at present, turning walls into canvases remains nothing more than vandalism according to many national laws around the globe. The common idiom to take to the streets has been used for years to reflect a diplomatic arena for people to protest, riot, or rebel. And early graffiti writers of the 1960s and 70s co-opted this philosophy as they began to tag their names across the urban landscapes of New York City, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia. As graffiti bloomed outward across the US, street art evolved in lockstep to encompass any visual art created in public locations, specifically unsanctioned artwork. The underlying impetus behind street art grew out of the belief that art should function in opposition to, and sometimes even outside of, the normalized systems of laws, property, and ownership. It should be accessible rather than hidden away inside galleries, museums, and private collections, and be democratic and empowering in that all people, 
regardless of race, age, gender, and economic status, should be able to create art and have it seen by others, which I do think is just so beautiful and inspiring. But the history of graffiti is so much ingrained in this idea of protest and rebellion, and perhaps that's nowhere more best illustrated than right here in Germany, at our capital city in Berlin, at perhaps its most famous landmark, the Berlin Wall. Within the context of Germany, and Berlin in particular, graffiti has played a large, if not paradoxical, role as social protest art. In the former GDR, the use of posters, graffiti, and one-page leaflets became one of the most visible acts of social contestion, and indeed, a petulant act of insubordination to GDR control. The Umweltblätter, produced by the activists of the Umweltbibliothek in the Prenzlauer Berg, are one memorable example. Graffiti also plays a key role in the history of that edifice of segregation and discontent. The initial barbed wire introduced in the 1960s grew into a sophisticated security system of concrete walls, electric fences, and guard towers, separating East from West, embodying all of the anxieties of the Cold War in the most concrete of senses. During the 80s, the wall was reconstructed and raised 14 feet tall, which made it kind of a perfect message board. A blank canvas for artists and dissatisfied individuals of West Berlin to express their opinions and affiliations. As many art historians have noted, the initial impulse to paint on the wall came not from the Berliners, but early settlers in the American-occupied sector consisting of draft resistors, anarchist punks, and Turkish migrants who used the wall to express their thoughts and beliefs. The Berlin Wall also became the meeting point for the first generation of graffiti writers, some of them being the children of U.S. servicemen who brought the booming spirit of their local graffiti culture to West Berlin. It is one of the many reasons why initial graffiti writings were heavily influenced by the New York graffiti scene. As the paintings on the west side of the wall flourished, the east side was left with the blank, sterile wall surface, where free artistic expression on the one side became kind of a marker of social and cultural differences of separate societies. And all of this changed after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when the city as a whole became a playground for artists of both sides, and the street art scene thrived in this atmosphere of newly found freedom. The street art movement continued to develop after the wall collapsed, with artists marching into eastern neighborhoods like Mitte, Friedrichshain, Prenzlauer Berg, and turning the gray areas of the city into vibrant art districts. Which is all so fascinating, given the fact that graffiti is still technically illegal in Berlin. And truth be told, not all residents are quite as in love with it, as others might be. To some, the mostly illegible scrawls, stylized names, and often fantastical pictures on walls, bridges, and subway trains, indeed almost any surface in the urban landscape, are an art form with an edge. They're rebellious, daring, and yeah, even beautiful. But to others, graffiti is nothing but pure urban blight, a disfiguring disease that creeps into neighborhoods, signaling their decline. In essence, what one man calls art, another calls vandalism. But what's interesting is that graffiti in all of its forms comes at a direct clash with our modern construction of property rights. A recent study found that in Germany, it costs property owners an average of 500 million euros a year to remove unwanted graffiti daubed on their properties and the courts must continually balance the freedom to express oneself with the right to own private property. And this conflict between these two fundamental rights is clearest in the case of wild posting, which is the practice of painting or drawing on private property without the owner's consent. 
While many graffiti artists will argue that wild posting is just an extension of their artistic expression, criminal law in Germany does define it as a property crime. It is punishable under subsection 303 of the criminal code, which stipulates that anyone who destroys or defaces another person's property by applying graffiti could face up to two years in prison and a fine of up to 5,000 euros. In response to the graffiti, Berlin actually formed a special anti-graffiti task force in the early 1990s, although the task force is underfunded and largely ineffectual. The German capital averages about 15 arrests per week, with fines ranging from 100 euros to several thousand euros. And although it's not an insignificant amount of money, by comparison, a task force spokesperson estimates that the property damage caused by graffiti in Berlin is 35 to 50 million euros a year. In addition, if this offense is actually committed against public property, it can be punishable under the Public Transportation Act. The offense of public transportation graffiti stipulates that the chief executive officer of the PTA may prohibit a person from being on or in any form of public transit conveyance or facility if they've been convicted of an offense. And it's been reported that the German railway Deutsche Bahn lays out 500 million euros annually for graffiti abatement. And I think this contradiction and conflict is personally what drew me to talk about this subject in the first place. You know, on the one hand, in Germany, especially in places like Berlin, graffiti really is everywhere. You can find it on walls, building facades, roofs, trains, subways. And in Berlin, most of the graffiti that you see visible was in fact painted illegally, usually at night, and is punishable by law. But at the same time, throughout Germany, you also find a lot of legally painted graffiti, sometimes commissioned by the cities themselves, by individuals or companies, made by graffiti artists or by advertising agencies using graffiti as a medium of communication, allowing them to reach a different audience than the more classical advertisements broadcasted on TV or on posters in the streets, for example. Graffiti and street art had an essential role in shaping the identity of the city when UNESCO proclaimed Berlin the city of design in 2006. And there's little doubt that the vibrant street art scene partially influenced this decision. And so in the time of globally shared enthusiasm regarding street art and urban art, as byproduct came the effect to turn the city's street art scene into the industry and institutionalize what was once known as a free-spirited movement. In 1990, artists from all over the globe were publicly invited to paint on the wall's empty east facades, celebrating reunification and expressing hopes for a brighter future. It's now known as the East Side Gallery, and this is one of the largest open-air museums in the world and an important tourist attraction in Berlin. And since the success of graffiti, many city governments across Germany have actually made graffitiing more easier with providing specific places where they encourage you to create street art. The most infamous in Berlin is of course the Mauerpark, Berlin's most famous graffiti wall and the one with the most history. Indeed, the graffiti wall is a remnant of the Berlin Wall that has been preserved, but sections of it are also freely accessible to those wanting to contribute to the visual culture of this landmark. There's also this wickedly cool abandoned tunnel in Schönberg, known as Priesterweg, and it's actually located in a forest. If you arrive after three o'clock, you pay one euro entrance to the ranger, you're free to graffiti as you wish. But even here in Freiburg, a city the fraction of the size of Berlin, there are actually 14 officially sanctioned and legal places to graffiti across the city. Seriously, the city of Freiburg even has this handy map that you can just use on their website to find where you want to make your next legal urban canvas. And I mean it when I say it, there are some seriously talented artists here. And sort of ironically, this art form, which was once known as like rebellion and anti-establishment has now become pretty mainstream. And they've actually adopted some rules in order to, you know, keep things not completely out of order. Very German. Anyone who paints or crosses another artist's work should be at least as good at spraying. Otherwise, the following applies. Complex work should be left for two to three months and all trash and waste should be taken away when you're done. 
Also, on the Freiburg City Tourism website, they advertise for visitors to come see the Graffiti House. And it's one of my personal favorite landmarks in the city. And at the end of the day, you know, art is a really subjective thing. But I do think that it's pretty cool, to be honest, that especially in Berlin, which was a capital city that was the stronghold of a dictator that once decried anything other than classical art to be quote unquote degenerate art, the fact that that city is now the home to the graffiti mecca of the world is, yeah, pretty cool if you ask me. Despite the abundance of illegal street art and graffiti, or perhaps because of it, areas like Friedrichshain remain among the most desirable Berlin locations for Berliners and tourists alike, contributing to the city's economy. On streets that are particularly well endowed, a regular sight is camera-toting tourists, smiling away and taking snaps of this incredibly raw, vibrant, and authentic display of art. And listen, I get it. Many cities would just be so upset and decry all of this as complete vandalism and make considerable efforts to clean and sanitize their cities. Street art is a tricky one for many people. Despite its popularity, there remains a lot of confusion about what is acceptable or even what is and what isn't street art. At its basics, street art is art that's in the streets, and this runs the gamut from intricate and technically skilled brushwork paintings through to the patina and layering of graffiti tags and murals. And at the end of the day, there's always kind of been this blurry line between graffiti art and graffiti vandalism. After all, many very well accomplished both Swiss and German artists that are well known today for their graffiti work were once considered criminals. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on all of this. In your opinion, is graffiti art or is graffiti vandalism? Where do you draw the line on that? And kind of related to this question is if we start to publicly sanction graffiti, we decriminalize it and we accept it as a form of artistic expression, does that also kind of go against the rebellious and anti-establishment roots that really kind of gave this angsty art form its nuance in the first place? I don't know, I, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts down below in the comment section. And as always guys, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Tschüss.